me the recording. And let me see, um, sometimes we are able to go live on YouTube, but sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and I'm not seeing the option for me to do that tonight. Are you seeing that, Carla? Usually it's there. So we'll just uh, upload that later. That's no problem. So um, good evening, everyone, on this beautiful um, Wednesday evening. It's kind of a shame for us all to be sitting inside in front of a screen, but um, we'll, we'll try to get right to the point. Uh, thank you for joining in today's webinar, Regulating Short-Term Rentals. Uh, my name is Katie Malinowski, and I am the Executive Director of the Tug Hill Commission. For those who may not know, the Tug Hill region covers 2,100 square miles in portions of Jefferson, Lewis, Oneida, and Oswego counties. The Commission is a small, non-regulatory New York State agency that provides technical assistance in the program areas of land use planning, local governance, community and economic development, and natural resources management. A few housekeeping items for this webinar, you are muted and your video is turned off to uh, conserve bandwidth and uh, uh, eliminate distractions. Please enter your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen um, and Chuck and Alicia will try to answer them throughout the presentation. Um, brief introductions. Thank you very much, Chuck and Alicia, for agreeing to do this webinar for us. This was kind of scheduled to replace uh, some training that we typically offer at our local government conference uh, at the end of March. We did not hold that again this year, so we've been doing a series of uh, online trainings to, to make up for that. So Chuck Malcolm is a partner at Hodge and Russ in Buffalo, New York. He concentrates his practice on environmental law, energy law, land use law, municipal law, real estate development, and legal issues involving industrial development agencies. He has experience working with private and public clients on matters involving both state and federal environmental statutes and assists municipalities with a wide range of legal issues, including environmental review and zoning. Um, Alicia Legland is an associate at Hudson and Russ in, Alb in Albany, New York. She is a member of the firm's environmental, renewable energy, and land use practices. Her experience and current work centers on environmental, energy law, and land use and zoning law. A primary part of her practice involves preparing zoning analyses for renewable energy developers, representing clients involved in Article 78 proceedings, and assisting clients with regulatory compliance matters and environmental due diligence review. So with that, I will turn it over to Chuck. Thank you. Thanks, Katie, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening, and we appreciate that so many have uh, taken some time out of their busy schedules to uh, attend the webinar. Um, you know, as the title indicates, we are going to discuss regulating short-term rentals, um, but I thought, you know, we'd just get started by just talking about an overview of what we're going to cover and how. Um, we thought that uh, the best way to deal with this is maybe to talk about the issue generally as to, um, you know, what the uh, what short-term rentals are, why they're such the rage, how this is evolving from a technological standpoint and also a cultural standpoint. Talk about some efforts um, across the country that we've seen um, to deal with this issue that's affecting communities uh, that have the uh, police power and the regulatory responsibilities um, for the health, safety, and welfare of the community. And then we'll go into specifics about New York law and the tools that local communities have um, to regulate and some, in some issues that, uh, um, many communities face and how to deal with those. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alicia Legland, who's gonna take us through um, the more broad overview and then um, she'll turn it over to me about halfway through and then uh, I'll go through some of the specifics with respect to uh, New York law issues. So uh, Alicia. Sounds great, thanks Chuck. Let me pull up my screen so everyone can see our slides here. Okay. Chuck, since I can see you, can you give me a thumbs up? Make sure we can see it. Everyone's good? Okay, great. Okay, so again, yes, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure here um, to talk to you tonight about regulating short-term rentals. So let's get started. Like Chuck said, I'm going to be taking a bit of the overview, talking about um, how they've become so popular, why, uh, what's going on across the country and the world as far as regulating them, um, and where we think we might be going next. Here we go. So one of the reasons that uh, short-term rentals have really become all the rage is because of the boom in what is the sharing economy. So this is typically 
um, you know, online based peer to peer exchange of goods and services. Um, so it typically focuses on, you know, underused assets, you know, you have a space that you don't use and you want to rent out, you want to clean out your closet and, and sell some clothes that you don't wear anymore, things like that. And some of the biggest companies in this space provide a platform that allows the people looking for these services, as well as the people selling the goods or service um, to connect to each other um, on their on their own platform. And the company is really just a facilitator. So some of the you know big names that we know of um, in the sharing economy that a lot of us either use or have definitely heard of, um, you know, Uber, Lyft, um, all those types of car sharing and ride sharing. Um, service uh, sharing of services like TaskRabbit. There's something that you need done. You can't do it. There's an app. Someone's someone's available to do the thing that you need done. Um, with goods, there's Poshmark and ThreadUp. You know, cleaning out your closet. You make a couple bucks selling it, and someone else is looking for it on the app, right? Uh, accommodations, which is what we're going to talk about today, with short-term rentals. Um, places like Airbnb, Verbo, HomeAway. These companies provide um, that platform for people to find uh, short-term rentals to connect them to people who have the extra space to rent out. And it's the same thing with co-working spaces. Uh, companies have commercial space, they're not using it, so they rent it out and that's how we end up with WeWork, which is pretty popular. Okay, so what are short-term rentals? They're also considered or called often vacation rentals. Basically, it's just a tenancy for less than 30 days. Um, typically in house, an apartment, some type of residential space. Um, and they're just like most things on the, you know, in the sharing economy that's very popular these days is it's online based, it's app based. So people with um, extra space that they want to rent out, they will market it or advertise it themselves on this platform. Um, and then on the same platform, the people looking for the space will be searching. Um, and a lot of times, the reason that also that they're so popular a lot of times is they can sometimes be cheaper uh, than the traditional hotel that people would normally stay at. So I looked for an example. Um, doing this research was a lot of fun looking at, you know, Airbnbs and hotels. Um, so I decided to look at Portland, Oregon, um, and I found uh, one bed, one bath, tiny home. Um, that was decked out and is rented on Airbnb for the sole purpose of short term rentals um, just outside the downtown area at 84 a night versus a very nice hotel right in the downtown area at 195 a night. So a lot of times people will make the make the balance to say, OK, maybe I'll, you know, we'll stay a little bit farther outside of the area that we wanted to visit. But, you know, with the lower price, maybe we can stay an extra night and things like that. So a lot of people do sway toward the short-term rental, the Airbnb, the Verbo, rather than the traditional hotel. So how did Airbnb become this very popular service that it is now? So it started in 2007, literally two roommates in San Francisco could not afford their rent. So they put a bunch of air mattresses in their apartment and they rented them out. A year later, they actually started their company and they've been incredibly successful ever since Airbnb actually went public as of last year. So right now there are 5.6 million listings on Airbnb um, all across the world, not even just across the country, all the major cities of the world, they have Airbnbs listed. Um, to date, there is 900 million guest arrivals that they've had on Airbnb um, and they've also Hosts on Airbnb have also earned to date over $100 billion in revenue. And accommodations range, you name it, you can find an Airbnb. Um, it goes all the way from private islands to simple apartments. So some interesting examples of places that you can find on Airbnb to stay. Um, one of them is in New Mexico. It's very cool. It's kind of almost like staying in a greenhouse. It has it's completely off the grid, completely sustainable. It generates its own um, and saves its own energy. It grows its own food. Um, it's in a completely sustainable off the grid development. Um, it's very cool. People looking for a very earthy, very natural uh, trip. This is definitely something for them. Similarly, there's another uh, very cool space for people who are looking for some of a, a natural trip 
some you know nature lovers would definitely love this. Um, there's a it's called the Delightful Dome in Colorado. Um, it's out near um, Sand Dunes National Monument. Um, so it's definitely a very cool place. So this was a lot of fun to look at as well. Then something a little bit uh, more close to home here in New York. Um, there was a 1810 hay barn um, that was converted originally into a wellness studio and then um, now into an Airbnb. The pictures were beautiful. Um, it looks like a wonderful place to stay. So this was a fun, more local one. And then this one was very interesting as well. This is the last example, um, a Airbnb that was originally a shipping container. Um, so this one was really cool. Uh, if you actually did look through the pictures, it really just looked like a very cute uh, studio apartment, but really a shipping container. So people have gotten very creative with um, creating Airbnbs and renting them out. Um, this one is prime example of that. Okay, so as we said, Airbnb started out in 2007, but it has grown exponentially since then. It's become very popular and has done very well, um, including after the very difficult year um, of 2020 for the hospitality industry, it has actually rebounded very well. It's 2021 numbers are on par with uh, 2019 and we're only halfway through the year. Okay, so with everything, there's good and bad. Same thing with short-term rentals. There are a lot of positives. There are also a lot of negatives. So to start with the good parts, um, it is an easy way for people to generate additional income. People tend to make a lot more money uh, renting out their unused space on a short-term basis, you get a lot of turnover, more people, um, rather than just having one or two long-term um, rentals over the course of a year or two. Um, to exemplify that, the average Airbnb host actually makes about $9,600 a year, which is pretty good. <laughs> um, so people do tend to um, make more money than they would have from more traditional um, rentals. So additionally, guests do contribute more to the economy of the area when they stay in an Airbnb or something similar like that um, than to a traditional hotel. Uh, like I mentioned before, people may balance the, you know, maybe the distance from the area that they want to stay. Um, if they can find something a little bit cheaper, maybe in like the residential outskirts of a city that they want to visit. Um, but then, you know, they'll stay an extra night or two, they'll visit you know, the coffee shop or the deli or something that's outside the city, they'll generate um, business there. So they end up staying longer. Um, so there are benefits to the community that can be seen with the short term rentals and more of the residential areas rather than the traditional um, hotel stay. But then there are the bad. Um, so very similarly to a rental car that no one ever washes, um, you know, Airbnb short term rentals, they tend to see the same type of thing. So Airbnbs are typically rented because people want to have fun um, and they don't treat it necessarily like they would treat um, a home if they were in someone's house as a house guest uh, versus being in a hotel room. Um, that just tends to come with the territory. So this produces impacts on neighbors. If it's in a traditional residential area, not so much just like in the downtown of a city, um, there's also increased cost over the long term for long term residents in the area. Um, and then, you know, these these types of problems lead to noise and traffic and and safety issues, things like that, which is what really upsets the residential community um, when we're talking about um, short term rentals. Um, and at the end of the day, if you have a bunch of short term rentals that are almost operating like a hotel in a residential community, is it really a residential community anymore? Because hotels are, are commercial, they're businesses. So if you have a bunch of houses and a bunch of apartments operating like a hotel, it's not so much a residential community anymore. And a lot of people that are long term residents often are not happy with that outcome. So again, communities don't all love Airbnbs because of these issues. Um, and they sometimes will protest and 
you know, be very much against um, any type of lax regulations or, you know, lack of regulations in municipalities and try to get um, regulations going in their, in their locality. So additional um, issues with short-term rental, some of the horror stories, if you will. Um, one of probably the most egregious, I think, that we uh, found there was a story that guests in an Airbnb found a hidden camera um, in a smoke detector. And, you know, the article went on to explain all the ways of detecting a, a hidden camera, but just the thought of having to find a hidden camera um, is horrifying to anyone I would imagine. Um, so that's not great. There are, there are horror stories like this that, that nobody wants to read when it comes to um, short term rentals. Another much more common problem um, would be, you know, the big parties that people tend to throw in these Airbnbs. Um, you know, there's this one story was there's over 100 people at this house partying until the middle of the night. Um, you know, they block the road with traffic and things like that. Um, so this is what gets neighbors all out of sorts, um, rightfully so, when Airbnbs, short term rentals um, are not treated with the respect um, that they should be, and they feel that these um, types of rentals shouldn't be in their communities. And then lastly, um, another story was basically that someone had stayed for only, only supposed to stay for a couple of weeks for their short-term rental, they refused to leave. So then the poor host had to go through this whole process of taking the person to court and doing an eviction and the whole thing. Um, when it really could have been as simple as just a, like a checkout of a hotel, but such was not the case for this one. So because of all of these potential negatives um, that may happen and have happened in certain communities, um, there has been an increase um, in regulatory efforts across the country and across the world in all the major cities that um, companies like Airbnb operate in um, to regulate short-term rentals. and. Initially, one of the biggest efforts to deal with this issue actually came from Airbnb itself, its internal policies. So Airbnb has a responsible hosting platform on its website um, that basically sets out a bunch of different policies for different things, um, trying to encourage the most responsible hosting um, for people who rent um, and list their, their rentals on Airbnb. So um, some of the policies that it has involve health and cleanliness, um, which certainly was um, a big thing and still is with COVID. Uh, there's you know, cleaning and sanitization processes that hosts um, will follow now. Um, there are safety protocols, like you know, making sure there's fire extinguishers and first aid kits in the rental spaces, um, you know, being mindful of neighbors, being you know, good, na good neighbor policies, things like that. Um, there are policies about permissions, you know, for, for instance, if there's a rental space that actually needs the permission of an HOA, um, making sure that that is taken care of. Um, there's also uh, policies about general regulations like tax implications and permitting that is sometimes required in certain areas, as well as um, suggestions for making sure that hosts on Airbnb check their <clears throat> excuse me, check their insurance policies to see what implications uh, renting on a short-term basis might have. Um, and then Airbnb also has a really, actually a very helpful um, tool on its website. And you can look and see the local regulation for any municipality where Airbnb has a significant presence. So of course the big ones, LA, New York City, um, San Francisco, you can click on those, but there are even you know smaller cities and smaller towns um, across the country as well as worldwide, um, and you can click on the municipality and see okay what are all of the regulations that are going to apply for a short term rental um, that an Airbnb host would have to follow. So it's actually a very helpful service that um, Airbnb now has. Okay, so. Some examples here um, of efforts to regulate Airbnbs across the country and across the world. So firstly, New York City, um, it was probably the first biggest city. Um, it was the first biggest city to um, regulate its issues with short-term rentals and Airbnbs. 
and it kind of got into this, you know, political legal battle with Airbnb back in 2014. Um, so at that point, hosts were making a ton of money um, renting out Airbnbs. And a lot of times these hosts were commercial users. So they owned a bunch of property and they were just renting them out, renting them out, renting them out. Um, they weren't just people with, you know, an extra room in their apartment that they, you know, thought they'd rent out here and there. These were commercial people just cranking out Airbnb rentals. Um, so this was having a pretty significant um, impact on the long-term renters in the area. So people were not happy. Um, so it ended up being that a lot of these Airbnbs were basically just violating the multiple dwellings law, which is a New York City law, um, governing class A multiple dwellings, which before 2010, um, multiple dwellings, class A multiple dwellings were defined as dwellings that are occupied as a rule for permanent residence purposes. Um, but following a bunch of litigation, the MDL was amended to define um, permanent residency of a dwelling, meaning less than 30 consecutive days. So um, a class A multiple dwelling after this change couldn't be rented for less than 30 days. Um, there were a few exceptions for borders and rumors, but for the most part, that was the new rule. Um, and at this time, um, most of the Airbnbs being rented in the city were class A dwellings. Um, so this caused a lot of issues um, trying to now abide by this new definition. So uh, New York City has since 2010, since issues in 2014, um, its battles with Airbnb um, up until this past year, it just earlier this year um, passed another regulation um, on short term rentals. It's a data sharing requirement, which basically means that Airbnb hosts have to share with the city certain information about themselves as hosts, their you know, name, contact information, things like that, as well as their listing, um, you know, the address, the listing um, information, things like that. Um, there are certain exemptions for this rule in the city. Um, so things like rentals that are longer than 30 days, again, based on the definition, that's technically not a short term rental. So the city's not as concerned about that. Um, class B listings, which under the multiple dwellings law, allow transient occupancy. So again, it's not really an issue. Um, and then it's also not required for hosts to rent um, for four or less nights per quarter or private or shared rooms with um, fairly low capacity. Um, again, the city is not as concerned with these. They're concerned with the, you know, the commercial users who were cranking out Airbnbs um, like crazy before 2014 and 2010. So some additional regulations that the city has come out with um, over short term rentals, um, one being advertisements for rentals in class A dwellings that actually violate the MBL are banned, um, which makes sense. Uh, I don't know who's necessarily advertising that they're uh, violating the MDL, but if they were, those are banned. Um, sometimes business licensing is required depending, um, depending on the space. There are certain additional rules and regulations governing rent stabilized and rent controlled spaces, um, which again, that makes sense. There's a whole separate host of laws that govern uh, rent controlled and um, rent stabilized properties in the city. Um, so they have their own rules. Um, and then there's also city and state taxes, several different kinds that might apply. Um, so people who are hosting on Airbnb um, definitely need to look into what might apply to their space. Alicia, can I interrupt you for one second? We have a question. It says, since Airbnb is classified as commercial or hotel, why is it that they aren't afforded the same protection when it comes to someone who won't leave? Hotels don't evict, they just call the police. Well, Katie, let me jump in on that because that kind of goes into some of the things that I'll be talking about. Number one is this is not clear that they're always classified as commercial hotel. Um, and that's one of the issues we're going to be talking about how to make sure that local codes deal with these issues appropriately. So they're not, I mean, you're, you're talking about a circumstance where you got a single family house, for example, let's just say, and then you've got a tenant there. 
um, who's overstaying their welcome, okay? So they rent it on Airbnb, but they're in a single family residential zoning district in a house. Um, and so who's to say whether they're, uh, what kind of tenancy there is? And that's usually not a matter that the police are gonna get involved in. They're gonna say this is a civil matter. So it's not quite that cut and dry and it blends the issues, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, shortly. Okay, thanks, sorry about that. No, thank you. Okay, so continuing with some of the issues that uh, New York City was seeing and still is, um, one of the other big you know, factors here that New York City often has to juggle when it's trying to regulate um, short-term rentals is the hotel industry, the hospitality industry. Um, it has a major interest in supporting um, its hotels. It's one of the tourist destination capitals of the world. Um, so it can't just say, you know what, Airbnbs are great. We're just going to let everyone who comes to New York City have an Airbnb and that's it. The hotels are just going to have to figure it out for themselves. The city is very concerned about supporting its, its hotel industry. Um, and, you know, Airbnbs are basically the opposite of a traditional um, hotel business. So it really is quite the divergence that the city has had to juggle. Um, and there's constantly um, city officials thinking about proposing um, taxes or new regulations and coming up with ways to, to deal with these such different options for people, but to have them coexist um, as options for all of the people visiting and living in, um, in and around the city. So going forward with New York City regulating short-term rentals, um, it's definitely going to be one to watch, um, if not the one to watch as far as how it continues to regulate short-term rentals or how it continues to tax, <clears throat> excuse me, short-term rentals, um, being that it's the biggest city um, in the country, how it ends up handling this and how it has handled it so far is definitely going to be um, something for us to watch and for other cities across the country to watch to figure out how it's going to go about um, you know, managing short-term rentals um, in its own municipalities. So San Francisco, the original home of Airbnb, um, is another one who has gotten very creative and has done very well with regulating uh, short-term rentals and balancing all of the different factors that play into it. Um, so originally there was some mixed reaction to Airbnb when it started to really take off there. Some people were really excited about the, the possibility of, of extra income and uh, you know, rental income, but others were worried that they would be priced out. Um, you know, San Francisco, like many cities uh, in California, it's incredibly expensive and it's difficult to find places. Um, so the long-term residents were very worried about being priced out. Um, but San Francisco, like the city, came up with regulations um, and a, a framework to deal with it. And it's been very successful um, since. So in San Francisco, Airbnb hosts or short-term rental operators, um, they need to have a business registration certificate and they need to have a short-term residential rental certificate. Um, so that's one of the ways that they are regulated. Um, hosts have to be the primary resident um, which the law there defines as living in the space for at least 275 days per year. Um, there's certain liability insurance requirements that hosts have to meet. Um, there are certain, again, additional requirements on rent controlled properties um, in San Francisco as well as um, there were in New York. Um, and there's additional regulations um, and policies and requirements um, that the building department will make sure are being followed um, in these uh, rented spaces. So additionally, there were regulations passed in San Francisco, similar to, similarly to New York about record keeping um, and reporting, safety measures, things like that. Um, the city also collects a transient occupancy tax, which interestingly with Airbnb, Airbnb actually collects that tax from the hosts and remits it to the city. So the hosts don't have to worry about it themselves, um, which is actually a really convenient um, thing. And then just very recently, I believe last year, or the year before, um, San Francisco passed another rent ordinance, basically saying that landlords can only evict tenants for just cause, um, which it's hard to make an argument that you want to evict tenants to bring in more short-term rentals um, would be just cause. 
So it's another layer of protection that the long-term residents were given um, who were worried about being priced out or evicted for the sake of people making more money renting out for Airbnb and similar short-term rentals. So San Francisco is another one that's just a, a model for how to regulate um, short-term rentals. So it was basically able to accomplish all of its goals at this point um, by one, creating a special board to deal with this issue, um, updating its old um, regulations and implementing new requirements. So LA, another big one, um, they were experiencing similar issues, particularly given the housing crunch there in recent years. Um, so a lot of um, major residential properties were skyrocketing prices, um, evicting permanent residents, um, and getting ended up with ended up getting higher um, rental payments from short-term renters. So LA, they responded by um, passing the home sharing ordinance that came out in 2019. Um, basically, similar to San Francisco the hosts have to register with the city um, and they actually have to post their registration on their listing for their Airbnbs. Um, and it has to be their primary residence, just like in San Francisco. But this law um, changes it a little bit, um, not quite the same definition. Primary residence is just the host's um, home for more than six months. Um, these registrations with the city uh, will last a year, so they have to be renewed. Um, this one, there's not just additional regulations with rent stabilization and rent control buildings, but that you just can't um, rent those out on short term bases. Um, if the host is a renter, not an owner, they need written approval from the owner. Um, and then similarly, again, to uh, San Francisco, the transient occupancy tax uh, is collected by um, sites like Airbnb and remitted to the city. But with LA, there is uh, a county tax, which is not um, collected and remitted by these platforms. So that's something that the hosts need to um, keep in mind. But interestingly with um, the ordinance in LA is that it has to be the primary residence. So secondary homes, vacation homes, people can't rent those out on short-term basis. So 30 day, 30, less than 30 days, um, they can't be rented out. So, this home sharing um, in LA is only allowed 420 days per year, um, but it can be extended um, if the host applies um, and is granted approval to do so. And there's additional requirements, um, you know, valid registrations, never having citations, um, things like that, that they can extend for that for longer than that 120 day or 120 night maximum of having rented out their, their space. So again, with LA, similarly to New York, um, there's data sharing requirements with the city. The hosts have to um, give the city information about their, their contact and their, um, their listings, things like that. Um, and this is really just to ensure compliance with the ordinance um, and only applies to uh, registered listings. So some more examples, there's a few interesting ones from Washington State. Um, Clyde Hill uh, kind of went through its municipal code to deal with uh, regulating short-term rentals. So here um, they have to be permitted. Uh, the property owners who are going to rent on a short-term basis have to be permitted. They also need a business license um, and there are minimum safety requirements that um, they must meet. Additionally, in Spokane, Washington, um, this actually is interesting. It divides um, short-term rentals into two different kinds. So there's a type A and a type B. Um, they require different permitting and different, uh, you know, one's an administrative, one's a um, conditional use permit. Um, you know, one allows commercial meetings, one doesn't. So it, it bifurcates um, two different kinds of um, short-term rentals that uh, can be regulated and are allowed um, in their municipality. So um, a really helpful thing that municipalities are doing is designating websites and areas of their, their online presence to explaining their um, short-term rentals regulations, their rules, their policies, as well as providing 
everything that someone would need to get approved for doing so. So um, two different examples from Colorado are showing how this makes it a lot easier. Um, so uh, in Boulder, there is a dedicated web page for short term rentals, um, and it has the rental application, um, the license application, excuse me, uh, packet for people to go on and see what they would need to do to um, be permitted for doing um, a short term rental. Same thing um, in Durango, Colorado, um, it has a whole web page um, explaining it's um, pretty strict uh, short-term rental regulations, um, which is helpful to have a, a breakdown for people to understand and make sure that they're complying if this is something that they choose to do. So then just a few more examples um, from cities across the world. Um, this is you know, dealing with the issues of, of short-term rentals and Airbnbs is not unique to the United States by any means. Um, Airbnb is very popular in a lot of um, popular tourist destinations. Um, so they've also stepped up and um, implemented a lot of different ways of regulating. So in Barcelona, that was another city that was really seeing a lot of Airbnb issues similar to the US. Um, so they are considered tourist households, they're short term rentals, um, and they have to be registered and the advertisements have to be clear as to that registration. Um, there's a lot of requirements in Reykjavik, um, I feel, especially, well, maybe before the pandemic, but I was constantly hearing people going to Iceland um, and Airbnbs are very popular there. Um, so there's a lot of requirements though. So people can rent out um, their apartments for up to 90 days per year um, of no more than 30 days. It's a short term um, before they need a hospitality license. And there's also um, a requirement for how much they can make doing this per year. Um, so either way that they have to be uh, registered and they have to meet certain health and safety um, guidelines similar to the other municipalities um, we've discussed. Um, and also there's Amsterdam who uh, came out with uh, similar short term rental regulations um, that basically again it kind of broke down short term rentals into three. So there's private vacation rentals, um, bed and breakfast and professional operators. Um, but regardless, uh, they all need to be registered and permitted. And the regulations will change depending on which category um, a rental will fall under. So Amsterdam is doing it too. Okay. All right. Pop Thanks, it over to <laughs> That's a, a great overview of, um, you know, um, we thought it would be good to just do a sampling. And, you know, we ended up in Reykjavik. I actually stayed at an Airbnb in Reykjavik. And yeah. I have to say it was a good experience. Uh, uh, but uh, we're going to come closer to home now uh, uh, and talk about uh, New York law. And uh, Alicia, I'll let you uh, give me the thumbs up if you can see my uh, slide there. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, what I think probably most of the folks that are on this uh, webinar are interested in, okay, what do uh, local governments, what powers do we have under New York law to deal with this issue? And the examples of other communities are nice, but how do we implement them? What authority do we have? How do we make, how do we put this into practice? Um, and the question, Katie, that you had, had read off with respect to, um, uh, you know, uh, how come the police can't just evict their commercial uses? Well, that's a question. Are they commercial uses? Um, or are they residential uses? And there certainly is a business aspect to this. Um, the property owner is renting uh, a room. It is similar to a hotel use in many respects, um, but, um, where we have seen problems and where these, where the case law kind of goes against municipalities is that confusion. Um, because if you think about the use of land, the use of the property, um, but for the duration of time, how is it different from somebody renting 31 days? How is somebody renting 30 days different from somebody that's renting 31 days? And, and that's kind of what we're going to discuss and see how it plays out, see what the case law says about it, look at, you know, the uh, sources of municipal authority and, and talk that through. And there's a lot of great questions that have appeared in the chat box. I see some of them. I'm going to try and address those as I go through the presentation um, and get to those issues, but I will try and do a review at the end in case I miss something, because I, I do see some great points. One of the questions early on was, okay, what do we do? What local laws can we implement? Um, all those things, and, and, and we're going to try and answer those questions. Um, but 
uh, I was doing a webinar uh, last week on um, small scale renewable energy. And one of the things that I talked about was where municipalities can get into trouble with old zoning codes. And one of the things you see, if you look at the case law that deal with zoning that are, that are that's actually litigated, Every year, there's a case that throws out a Zoning Board of Appeals decision because it applies the pre-1992 uh, area and use variance standards. They use the prior, you know, for area variances, practical difficulties test. And so the, the ZBA doing its, trying to do its best is looking at its own code and its own forms and is applying the wrong standard. And so um, a lot of times, Codes that are not updated, codes that don't address new situations or new uses can cause significant problems. And in the renewable energy context, we talked about how the general public utility use um, that's in a lot of zoning codes may have unintended consequences by having, uh, allowing a, you know, essentially a renewable energy project in a residential zoning district even um, that was not anticipated. And, and the similar thing happens with respect to these uses. If you have a single family definition that doesn't get into a certain level of detail, how do you tell somebody that's renting a uh, property out for 29 days that they're not allowed to do it, but somebody renting it for 32 days is? And so that's kind of how we're going, you know, how, that's what, what we are initially looking at is the problem that's presented here and, and how do you deal with that? Um, but let's talk about real quick um, the municipal authority, and and I think everybody is generally familiar that you know municipalities have a broad uh, set of authorities and tools to regulate land use under Article 16 of the Town Law, Article 7 of the Village Law, um, you know, uh, to um, protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Um, that's the key. The, the the municipalities have the police power. Um, with respect to hotel type uses, motels, inns, boarding houses, et cetera, there's actually a specific grant of authority in the town law. Um, I put it there. Um, so there is, there is a significant level of authority to regulate and to regulate the use of land and to regulate activities that um, are likely to impact the community. And uh, there is specific authority um, in uh, the enabling acts and, and the grants of powers to local governments to deal with these specific uses. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, as a general principle, but I think something very important just to touch on, you know, zoning is a legislative act and local ordinances enjoy a strong presumption of constitutionality and validity. And they will be upheld if there is, you know, any reasonable basis or rational basis for the law. So in a circumstance where I think one of the questions is, can, can we have a discrimination suit? Uh, you know, uh, let me just see if I can double check that question here. Um, but it was, uh, let's see, I apologize. Um, would having different laws for a person who hosts versus someone with a vacation home lead to discrimination lawsuits? The answer is definitely not, um, you know, because, uh, well, first of all, let me rephrase that. Anybody can always sue you. <laughs> Whether they'll win is another question. Um, so uh, in, in circumstances where you're regulating and you're using your zoning authority uh, to regulate an impact, you know, those laws are going to be upheld if they're rational, if they have a rational basis, if they are, uh, a discrimination lawsuit is generally when you're, you're treating similarly situated uh, individuals or companies differently. And generally that becomes a problem when there's a protected class or something of that nature. But what you've described in your question um, is not similarly situated circumstances. You have somebody that's hosting versus somebody that's renting the whole thing out. And we'll talk about the differences and how there is a rational basis for that. We talk about types of regulations just real quick. You know, a, a bed and breakfast defined where a host stays and is on premises during the stay is different than a circumstance where you're running out the entire uh, single family residence. You have somebody on site, an owner there, guests tend to act differently. Um, when you have a, a, an owner on premises, there's a local person that's always there to answer questions, deal with issues as they come up. So there is a rational basis for why you, would, you may treat those things differently. Um, but, but the point I'm making here is that your, your power as a municipality is broad. 
So let's look at a, a, a real life zoning saga that we actually dealt with at our firm. Um, you know, uh, if, if you can see there, there's uh, um, a one unit Airbnb, then there was a four unit apartment building uh, that was turned into short term rentals uh, akin to a hotel. And then you have a residence um, down there kind of quasi surrounded by these things. And, you know, there was, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of enjoyment going on at the uh, four unit and the one unit Airbnbs. And, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, individual uh, living in the in the single family residence is trying to live his life, go to work. Kids got to go to you know school and all all those good things. And there's a party going on every night. And you get people that are outside, you know, hooting and hollering, and they're drunk and are leaving things in the lawn or walking across his lawn to get to the road, trespassing. You know, motorcycles rubbing. I mean, you know, so it it has a a significant set of impacts. To residential communities that um, you know need to be addressed and dealt with, and, and in this case, you had a neighbor filing a complaint, noise, parked cars, trespassing, debris thrown around, and so when the code enforcement officer gets a complaint like this in a circumstance where you know the code says what it says, the question becomes: Well, um, is this a use that's allowed um, under the zoning code? And some of the factors. Um, that, you know, the, you know, I'll give you the facts, if you will. So in this circumstance, you have a residential zoning district that allows a single family dwelling. Okay. Well, um, with respect to the, um, the single family resident Airbnb, there's not an issue. Um, you know, the four unit, um, you know, uh, apartment building is a non-conforming use um, that presents its own set of challenges. And then the code defines the dwelling as any building or portion thereof designed or used exclusively as a residence or sleeping place for one or more persons erected on a permanent foundation. And a dwelling unit being defined as simply as a residential unit other than a mobile home with one or more rooms, including cooking facilities and sanitary facilities as a dwelling structure designed as a unit for occupancy by not more than one family for living and sleeping purposes. So there's nothing in there that really talks about um, you know, duration of time. Uh, and, you know, the question becomes, does the sleeping part uh, or the number of days there have some sort of impact on that, uh, on that use? Um, so obviously, in most codes, you have, you know, provisions that say, um, you know, any use not specifically listed as an approved as of right or specially permitted use is not allowed, which is pretty standard. Um, you know, there's a separate provision that had a definition of tourist homes, um, which required a license and they defined tourist homes separately. And then there's obviously the uniform code uh, compliance issues, which, you know, prevent changes of use without um, or the nature of the occupancy of an existing building unless um, uh, a certificate of occupancy authorizing the change has been issued. So. Um, with respect to all of these issues, uh, the question becomes, okay, how does the municipality move forward on this issue addressing this uh, complaint by uh, a resident? And the question is who interprets the code in the first instance? Well, obviously it's the code enforcement officer or the uh, administrative official that's charged with that responsibility. And those determinations get appealed um, to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and uh, as far as what the remedy is uh, for an aggrieved party, well, um, you know, if you don't like the determination of the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, you have the ability to file an Article 78 proceeding to challenge that in court, um, or you can ask for variances. Um, you know, uh, the question becomes area variance or use variance is, uh, is a duration, a type of limitation that is a in the nature of a use classification, or is it a another type of, uh, of use classification that require a lesser standard. And the case law on whether something's an area variance or use variance typically leaves it to the Zoning Board of Appeals to make that determination. And that usually is given some level of deference. So um, here's how some case law came out on these types of issues where, you, where there was no real definition in the codes. Uh, first, Atkinson v. Will, this was a circumstance where the petitioners owned the Lakeshore property. And the property was located in a single or multifamily residential zoning district. And it was a six bedroom residence and the petitioners bought the property. And then 
you know, if this doesn't sound like a business, I don't know what probably could, but they immediately joined the Chamber of Commerce and, and advertised kind of a rental company type circumstance. And they began marketing their property for short term rentals on the Internet. And then that kind of fired off an outrage uh, by the neighbors. And um, the zoning enforcement officer determined that the petitioners were operating a tourist accommodation as a commercial use, and that was violating the zoning code, which limited the uses in that district to residential. The Zoning Board of Appeals affirmed, and then an Article 78 proceeding was commenced by the petitioners. And then the court, interestingly, kind of set the framework for how they usually analyze these circumstances. And, and the way it typically goes is that a reviewing court will defer to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, uh, but where the issue is one, what they call pure legal interpretation of the underlying zoning law or ordinance, deference is not required. So um, where it's a matter that doesn't you know, really need a lot of uh, factual uh, resolution, it's just a matter of interpreting what the code says, the courts are gonna make their own determination. And um, that's kind of at odds with the traditional municipal deference that you'd expect. And the other principle that's really interesting here um, that I think everybody should take note of is that there is a general rule um, that zoning is supposed to be strictly construed against the municipality and any ambiguity in language is supposed to be resolved in favor of the property owner. And the way that, um, you know, th that doctrine has emerged is because z uh, zoning laws are really contrary to the way things always used to be a long time ago. You know, a long time ago, everything was governed by real property rights and you could do what you wanted on your own property as long as you didn't commit the tort of nuisance with respect to your neighbors or the general public at large, public and private nuisance. And so that's how your land was uh, use was governed is that as long as you didn't commit that tort, you were free to use your property as, as you saw fit. Zoning obviously is contrary to that. And since zoning has been, you know, described as contrary to that, that bedrock principle of real property law, it's strictly construed and any ambiguities are resolved against the municipality seeking to enforce them. So in circumstances where the zoning code doesn't speak to the issue, it could go either way, it's a coin flip, you know, the courts have, have sided with the property owner. And so here they talked about uh, what the town code definition says. It also didn't help that a seasonal, seasonal cottage appeared in part of the definition. And there was a separate definition for hotel, motel and resort that were you know, obviously different than um, what, uh, you know, what this use was. And so um, they found uh, that uh, the petitioners, um, uh, you know, this was not a commercial use. This was the fit within uh, what was allowed under the residential zoning. Now, keep in mind, the court did not say that a municipality couldn't regulate this or limit this. They said that the municipality didn't. Um, which is a key distinction. Um, and that's borne out in the next case, Sewell versus Scalsey, um, which is another case, um, you know, very similar facts. And there was a note that um, uh, the, there was, uh, the, the owner of the property was not renting out portions of the unit. It was renting out the whole unit. So it met within the definition of, um, uh, of, uh, uh, a, a residential multifamily dwelling. Um, and the court noted specifically here that the town could have easily included a limitation on duration of rentals, but didn't. Um, and that's, uh, that's important. And then um, another similar uh, uh, case, which I won't, uh, I don't wanna run out of time, so I'm not gonna cover those, but those are cases that will be available. Um, and, uh, uh, you were able to um, take a look at those um, afterwards. So again, one of the questions is, are we going to uh, provide this PowerPoint? We will provide this to Tug Hill and they can distribute it either as a link in the YouTube video that's going to be put up or they can send it to the, uh, the distribution list of folks who signed up for the webinar. I'll let Katie navigate the logistics of that. Um, so the takeaways from all this that we just talked about is that you shouldn't rely on old zoning codes to deal with these issues. Courts are going to side with the property owners in these cases. 
and that you can't rely on traditional municipal deference in dealing with these issues. You can prohibit, it th prohibit them, and if you can prohibit them, you can certainly regulate them. And um, it behooves everyone involved where this is, if this is occurring or was likely to occur to develop a comprehensive ordinance to deal with this, specifically define them clearly, um, you know, have legislative findings and then develop a, a system uh, of regulation. And when regulating, it's important to know, again, back to the municipal authority, what are the bounds of that authority? Um, well, number one is you're supposed to regulate the use of land and not the operational details of specific businesses. Um, the Bonefish Grill case illustrated that, which was a case that, up, that upheld a condition uh, in, imposed by a zoning board, which was to limit the hours of the restaurant to when the parking was available, and that was reasonable. And while it was kind of in some ways dealing with the operation of the business, limiting the hours, it was tied to a land use issue. It was tied to an impact that was uh, parking traffic that was something that was, was uh, land use related. Um, one of the kind of seminal cases, St. Ange just talked about how it's not about who owns the property. It's not about the details of the business. You know, it's about the regulating the use of land. And when you impose conditions, it has to be related to the use of land and those impacts. And the Old Country Burgers case is one of my favorites. It's where there was a long drawn out saga disputing the issue of um, uh, the um, ability to have a drive through in a Burger King restaurant. And after much litigation, it was uh, it was resolved that a drive through could be opened, but it could not be used during mealtime. <laughs> and the court basically said that's kind of a ridiculous condition. It's operational details. We're talking about the use of land um, and that condition was overturned. Um, but the power is still broad and it, as long as it can be tied to the use of land. So when you're getting into the operational details of different, you know, regulating the Airbnb, as long as it's tied to the impacts, um, you know, that for purposes of zoning, that's, uh, that's going to uh, pass muster. The non-conforming use issue. So you have a situation where let's say that you're going to update your code and you're going to make a change. Um, to the to what the code says, and uh, the question is, what do you do with the uses that are that are ongoing and uh, continuing? And you know, generally, non-conforming uses, though lawful, are disfavored. And the Court of Appeals has reaffirmed that the overriding public policy of zoning um, is to eventually get rid of them. So, if you change it to not allow short-term rentals in residential zoning districts, eventually. The law is going to support your restriction of that and eventual elimination. And if during the, the course of time when you change that law, there are existing short term rental uses being operated, um, you know, you can do things to get rid of them lawfully. Um, you can, uh, this is a case that kind of dealt with the matter where in 1966 there was a zoning ordinance that didn't restrict the short term rentals. And then there was a restriction placed on them later on. And the question was, did the short term rental use did that get non-conforming use status to the point where it could continue lawfully after the change in the law? And um, it's clear that you can terminate them, you can amortize them out, um, as long as that amortization period is reasonable. So you can provide a provision that says you can, um, you know, if there's a lawfully existing non-conforming use, we're gonna provide that that terminates within a year or two years after the uh, effective date of the local law. And um, you know that uh, has been held in court to be reasonable under the circumstances. And um, you know I, I put a case down here, Suffolk Supply Incorporated, which um, upheld a one-year amortization for an asphalt plant, which is a much more significant capital investment than someone buying a property for a short term rental that still retains its value as a long term rental or as you know, the ability to sell it as a single family residence or a multifamily residence, whatever it is. But the power is there if a community wants to get rid of them in certain locations that, that are not appropriate in the community's view under the under the comprehensive plan or under the community's plans and goals. Um, they can be restricted, and if they're ongoing at the time of restriction, they can be amortized out. And generally, in those laws, what you'd want to have is an administrative remedy, a provision for extensions and circumstance where they can prove, the owners can prove to you that they won't be able to recover their investment or there's a, uh, or there's a hardship 
um, that's an important uh, point that you'd want to include as well. So in determining how you want to regulate these, what you want to do, you want to ask yourselves some, some important questions. Do you want them? Um, some communities, it's very important. There are certain communities we represent, towns that rely on tourism and their proximity to certain destinations, um, you know, like Niagara Falls or, or Canada, make it conducive to want these uses. And they're important to the community as part of the business plan and, and part of, you know, the, the growth plan. And so uh, you want to look to see, and, and, you know, and get some community feedback. Maybe if you're amending your comprehensive plan, or if you know you you have a committee that's looking at this, or the planning board does your typical recommendations and review to, to analyze this, and then look at what types of short-term rentals that you want. We talked earlier about you know uh, ones that allow hosting, ones that allow you to to rent out your primary residence. Um, there are different types, and there are different uh, impacts with different types, um, which, uh, you know, is something you'd want to think through, evaluate and in fashioning your regulations, where in your community you want them and how should they be regulated? There's different examples we've went through from other communities, but, you know, generally, um, you know, how do you deal um, with those issues generally? And it's, it, it's a policy decision, something that the community is going to want to think about and, um, and, and consider and develop their own things that are gonna, their own regulations that are gonna work best um, for them. And, and some just general tips on fashioning these regulations. I think number one is you wanna have findings. Okay, what is the issue? What are the problems? Um, why would you wanna regulate these? Why would you wanna treat them differently? Um, you know, something that would support, you know, a legal challenge um, or you know, as we talked about the potential discrimination claim, explain why these are different, explain what the issue is. And, um, you know, have a clear definition. You know, you don't want to leave it to ambiguity. You want to be very clear on what short-term rentals are allowed, what are what short-term rentals are and, and where they're prohibited. And I recommend a fee structure. Um, you know, you have the right as a municipality to charge fees to defer the cost of administration of the program. If you're going to be reviewing these applications, reviewing renewals, dealing with complaints, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, issues that come up with respect to administering the program, you want to charge a fee that has to be reasonable and reasonable calcul reasonably calculated to defer those costs. And then determine how exactly you want to utilize your zoning or police power to regulate these. Do you want to have an application process? Do you want to regulate them by special use permit? Do you want to have a licensing law? You know, there are different procedural mechanisms that can be used uh, depending on how you want to handle it. And it could be different boards or bodies to handle it. It doesn't have to be the legislative body. It could be a planning board. It could be a zoning board of appeals that issues these permits. So identifying how, what procedures and processes do you want to put these things through, um, which boards you want to have handle that, uh, which conditions and criteria do you want to be evaluated before a permit could be issued are all important considerations. You know, and obviously you'd want to have an application process with minimum requirements, with information about the use, the, the owner, the history. Um, you know, again, considering residency requirements, have a guest registry that the owner keeps to know who's there on the property at all times in case there's an incident or something happens that requires some further follow-up. Um, you may want to cap the number of days it could be used as a short term rental, make sure there's adequate parking. You may want to just, you know, and again, this is this is solely a policy consideration, but do you want them in higher density or lower density neighborhoods and how do you want to deal with that. One of the key things that I've seen a lot of communities focus on is they want to have somebody local in all circumstances that um, can be the contact person for the responsible party handling the problems. Um, somebody that they can reach out to and call. Um, you know, you also want to talk about your noise and nuisance provisions. Um, you know, you also want to be very careful there uh, because sometimes noise ordinances are incredibly difficult to enforce uh, because of vagueness. And uh, so I would take a look at those and uh, consult with your municipal attorney on ensuring the enforceability of your existing uh, regulations. Uh, deal with garbage, uh, where, the, where the debris is able to be collected. Um, where it can be placed on the property, um, you know, you know, making sure that there's not a cluster of these things, uh, you know, require spacing to ensure that there's not, you know, an inundated or surrounding situation that we've had uh, in some communities that these are going to be located in traditionally residential zoning districts. 
Um, requiring requirements I've seen for notifying neighbors. Um, you got to be careful there that this doesn't get blended with like, you know, giving neighbors any type of veto power or a circumstance where, um, you know, general community opposition is steering the zoning decision. But um, it does, you know, it, it may make sense to when there's an application uh, to potentially provide a notification requirement, um, you know, that that may be something you'd want to look at limiting the number of guests and again limiting turnover, all those things are mostly policy decisions as, as, as you work through these. Um, I did get a question about, is there a model law? I have not seen a model law, but there are examples um, in New York of communities that have adopted regulations that may be helpful to uh, review if any of you are, are looking at fashioning these for yourselves. And just as a word of warning, um, you know, some of the enforcement challenges that you're likely to see late night issues. I mean, the code enforcement officer doesn't often work late at night and a lot of the problems happen at night, a lot of the parties, a lot of the, a lot of the noise. Um, so there, there are issues with respect to that. Um, you know, if you're gonna have a system where you have permits or, or potentially wanna revoke a license or a permit when there's violations, make sure that due process is followed. Um, and then, um, you know, noise and nuisance laws are, um, you know, again, make sure that those are updated and have your municipal attorney review those for enforceability. One of the other questions that I got in the chat box dealt with enforcement. Um, you know, how do you enforce these? How do you make sure that people aren't just going to do what they want? Um, well, again, that is a problem in, you know, in the sense of it's, it's <laughs> enforcement presents its own set of challenges for just about everything. And I think these, because of the nighttime issues um, and the fact that you know, uh, they present their own unique challenges, but, you know, enforcement is, is not much different than how you treat any circumstance. Compile evidence, um, document, um, you know, we've uh, been retained in certain circumstances where you've had an owner continuously violate the uh, law to rent property short term to go to st state Supreme Court and get an injunction. And then you have the, you know, the power to punish uh, for contempt um, so that's an option, depending on how serious the issue is and how um, how frequent the violation is, and um, to what extent the community wants to, um, you know, uh, spend resources trying to address and resolve the issue. But, you know, enforcement can be done, but there are some challenges that have to be negotiated uh, and worked out throughout the the process. And, you know, you're going to see an uptick in variances, uh, probably where you have circumstances where these are not allowed. Um, you know, I just put the area variance and use variance tests in here. Um, but, uh, you know, we've had circumstances where property owners have applied for use variances, um, arguing that they can't get a reasonable rate of return because they bought the property, expecting it to be used as a short term rental. And then they've alleged taking. Um, and, and those cases have gone nowhere. Um, you know, they, you know, Wallace versus uh, Town of Grand Island was one case from the fourth department where that was thrown out. Um, but you, you are likely to have a zoning board of appeals considering some of these applications if there's an ongoing use and then it's ultimately eventually terminated. Um, so, and with that, um, Article 78 proceedings, um, you know, are, are the, uh, you know, subject to judicial review. Um, and uh, in, in variance applications and in variance uh, judicial review, those are um, subject to great deference uh, by the courts. And that's not an interpretation, pure legal interpretation issue like we talked about. So in denying variances or, or even granting variances, the courts are gonna defer um, to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I'm gonna skip over the last case, which I thought is interesting um, with respect to how courts uh, deal with um, uh, interpretation challenges. Um, I invite you to take a look at that case. It deals with um, you know, a, a, a church and what a church is, um, but I'll let you guys um, uh, take a look at that. And with that, I am gonna go back to the chat and look at any questions um, and, and try and address those uh, before we wrap up and I see that we're kind of running out of time. But uh, let me go so back yeah, in here. Chuck, um, this is Katie. Uh, I've been yeah. trying to figure out which ones you kind of haven't addressed and which ones you haven't or have, haven't haven't. Um, one of the questions you kind of, I think just touched on, but I wanted to confirm. So in my, um, Annie asks, in my area, people are buying property specifically to use as vacation rentals. If my town decides to limit short-term rentals, 
Um, what happens to the people who bought the, them for that purpose? Can we force them to stop? Yes, you can. Um, and again, it goes back to how you deal with non-conforming uses. So um, in one, uh, I'm going to give an example of a, uh, of a town that um, had a circumstance where um, short-term rentals were ongoing. Um, the town's position was that they were prohibited, um, but the court felt otherwise. <laughs> Um, so the town adopted a law um, to prohibit them in residential zoning districts. And the uh, question was, well, what do we do with the ones that are going to try and continue as a non-conforming use? Because most communities have, a, you know, and are required to have some provisions dealing with non-conforming use. And, and generally, you can continue if it was lawful at the time. And a court said this was lawful at the time. And then um, unless you you uh, desist for a year, which is pretty standard, you can continue it. Um, but, um, what you, what you, what they did in that circumstance is they said, okay, we're going to give you a year, um, to recoup your investment that based on the type of use, based on the type of investment, a year is a reasonable time to recoup some of that investment. And then, um, after that they could apply to the Zoning Board of Appeals for an extension of the amortization period. And there were certain factors, you know, similar to what a use variance would ask for as to what would justify an extension. And so there was an administrative remedy to deal with that. So you had a lot of folks apply for an extension after the year and not get it. And then they ceased the use. You had, I think one person that applied, got it for another year. Um, but you can, people who are buying them with the intention of using them as short-term rentals, um, you can stop them. You can zone it out. Um, it's been done. It's been upheld by the courts. Um, but maybe you may not want to do that. Uh, you know, that's a policy decision. Maybe you want to leave it as non-conforming uses. If it was being done at the time it was legal, it can continue. So that's, again, uh, something for the legislative body to consider and make its own determination. Okay, thank you. Um, another person, Kenneth asks, can a town be liable for not having ordinances in place for incidents that occur at an Airbnb or some kind of rooming house? The answer to that question is no. Uh, municipalities uh, exercise of their governmental functions uh, have, have uh, immunity from uh, you know, those types of claims. So um, you are not as a municipality going to be held liable for not adopting an ordinance. There's some communities that don't have zoning at all. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the, all that state, the state requires the building code uh, be applicable everywhere, but some communities just, you know, you can do whatever you want. Um, you know, uh, and again, it's, it's, you know, as long as you're not creating a nuisance, but the nuisance claim is against the neighbor, not against the municipality. Okay. Um, the question, can you regulate a dwelling to supply proper fencing or screening to other residential properties if that dwelling is established as an Airbnb? Yes. Okay, um, another question. How would you fashion a limitation on spacing slash density? I'm not sure exactly. What I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, I think I know what the question is getting at. I think it's getting at, um, uh, you know, what do you recommend as far as like, do you wanna have a lot of Airbnbs located next to each other? And I think that all is gonna depend. What is, where are you looking at putting these? Is that a traditional residential district? You know, it may not be a bad thing if you've got a segment of Airbnbs all together that are all, you know, being used similarly. I mean, it's similar to the traditional Euclidean zoning model of putting like uses alike together. Um, so, you know, uh, but the question is, if they're interspersed with traditional residential uses, do you want to limit the number that could be in any one neighborhood? Um, you know, so, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any specific recommendations on it because I think it all depends on the specifics of the community. Um, some of these are kind of more tax related, not really land use related. So I'm not going to ask you those. Yeah. Ones. I mean, I, I'll just say this is that we've had problems and we've had circumstances where people aren't paying the bed tax and, you know, that's, that's an enforceability issue. I think it's changing now with some of the like Airbnb, I think like you know, collects it. I think Alicia talked a little bit about that, um, but that's not a municipal issue, an enforcement issue. It's not something that can be considered in the land use context. Okay. 
Um, is there a state fire code requirement for rental properties for safety? You know, um, I, you know, as far as what the specifics of the fire code are, I'm not 100% sure, but I know that there is a difference. There's a definition for transient and they define it as less than 30 days and they have different requirements based on that occupancy classification, or at least they did last time I checked. And so um, I think that certain requirements um, in there include like, um, you know, uh, you know, exit signs or, or things like that. But it's been, a, to be honest, I haven't like looked at it recently. So I, I, that's about as far as I can go on it. I think we've covered a lot of these other ones. I don't know, Alicia, do you see anything that we didn't, we missed? Um, well, let me, uh, let me, let me just, uh, let me just offer this. I mean, um, you know, feel free to, if you have any specific questions, you could send me an email. If there's something that I didn't cover that you feel um, that should be covered, I will put my uh, email in the uh, chat box. Um, I would just ask you, please do not ask me for a, a copy of the presentation <laughs> because that is going to be provided by Tug Hill. <laughs> yep. you, you get like, 10 or 12 emails that I have to respond to and pull out the presentation. It's not that I don't want to, it just takes up a lot of time, but uh, if you have specific questions that we didn't cover that you've asked, shoot me an email and I'll do my best to, to provide my thoughts. Um, and I've also put in the, in the chat our, the link to our YouTube channel. So this, and, and again, this will all go out in an email to everyone who registered um, tomorrow with all this information, the, 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 PowerPoint attached, um, a certificate for everyone who attended attached, this link to the YouTube channel, but it is here as well. Um, yep, the certificate of attendance will go um, to everyone who came. So you can provide that to your municipality. Um, someone said their ADA question did not get answered. I'm trying to find that. Um, Seeing it like I say, just uh, shoot me an email with the question. We apologize. I think I see it. Um, this, I don't know, this is the same. Can a host be sued if the property is not disability accessible on the grounds that it's a public, public accommodation? I think that's the question. I'm sorry, what was that? Can a host be sued if the property is not disability accessible on the grounds that it's a public accommodation? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if there's an exemption in the law, so I'm not sure. Um, so an asks, is there an example of a good definition of primary residence? Um, Alicia, what did the, uh, you had it up there for Los Angeles, didn't you? Wasn't there like a good example of how they treated it? Yeah, it's six months out of the year in LA. Um, so, you, so you'd have to live there for six months out of the year. Um, so you, so you'd at least have to occupy it for that amount of time. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then, so someone followed up with a question, is there a good definition of tourist home? No, <laughs> there's not. I hate those definitions. I don't even know what a tourist home even is. And it's like th th those codes all were developed in the 1930s and yeah. 50s, I think. So I wouldn't go there. I mean, because I mean, if you think about it, what is a tourist home? Like, does anyone call anything a tourist home anymore? I mean, no. So I wouldn't even bother. With it. I would just <laughs> define what a short term rental is and move on. Yeah. Well, um, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you again so much. You're getting lots of comments in the chat about what an informative presentation this was. It's, a, it's an issue that really is ubiquitous across New York State. It doesn't, you know, all different types of communities have these short-term rentals, whether it's on the water in the summer or whether it's in Tug Hill for snowmobiling in the winter. Um, so it's really um, applicable to everyone. So thanks again for doing this and uh, appreciate your time. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks very much. It was our pleasure. Thank you so much. Good night.